Hello, it's Duncan. It's been a busy week here as I've been moonlighting for a new client, as well as doing my day job on Team Gilded Rose. So I'm going to take a break from the JSON parsing, that is a break from Gilded Rose, and instead publish a video covering the refactoring from the first chapter of the book that wrote in that price, called Java to Kotlin, a refactoring guidebook. If you'd like to see more of the refactoring from the book, or indeed a complete video series of the book exercises, please let me know in the comments below. This refactoring is from Chapter 3 of Java to Kotlin, Java to Kotlin Classes. The chapters usually have an introduction setting the stage for the refactoring to come, but in this case we'd like to build up a little momentum, so we'll just get straight down to it, with two classes from Travelator, our trip planning app. The first is the email address class, which is really just data. And then the money type, which is a little bit more complicated because of a relationship between its properties. Travelator has a class in it called email address, and this is a nice simple place that we can use to warm up on Kotlin. Let's have a look at the Java version. You can see it has a couple of fields, the local part and domain. They're both final, which means that we can't set them. Email address is immutable. Because these are fields and private though, we have getters for them here, get local part and get domain, which just return the values of the fields. We have two ways of constructing an email address. This one here is the constructor which takes the local part and domain and just assigns the fields. And there's this static method here, parse, which takes a value with the two parts separated with an at, parses out two bits and returns an email address. And then finally, down here, we have equals and hash code and two string to allow us to compare our email addresses, put them in sets, use them as keys and print them out. Well, that's quite a bit of Java for not a great deal of functionality. Let's see what it would look like in Kotlin. IntelliJ has a way of converting Java to Kotlin for us. So we can say convert Java file to Kotlin file. At this point, IntelliJ offers to fix things it might have broken. So let's just say yes there. The conversion deletes the Java file and replaces it with a Kotlin file, but we can compare the old and the new side by side here. Let's have a look, see what's changed. Well, first of all, the Java class said public class, but in Kotlin classes are public by default, so that's been removed. The next thing we notice is that where here we say private final string local part, here we say local part string. So the order of types and identifiers is reversed in Kotlin and we use colons to separate them. In practice, we find that most people get used to that change very quickly. Now, what about this val? Well, that val sounds a value and here, these values are both constructor parameters, properties, and getters. What do I mean by that? Well, our email address has a constructor here, but actually in Kotlin, that's hidden here. We could put a constructor keyword in there, but we don't have to. But the compiler will automatically take these parameters and assign them to fields of the same name. That's why we don't have to have these fields in our Kotlin class. Now, our Java class also has get local part and get domain methods so that we can read the values of these fields. Kotlin generates those for us automatically. So in fact, if we were to look at callers of domain here, you'll see that in this marketing class, this is address get domain. And that is a method that's generated by the Kotlin compiler for us because we have a domain property here. Going back to our Java class, we had this email address parse, which was static. That meant we could call email address dot parse, giving it a value and it would return an email address for us. In Kotlin, we don't have static methods in the same way. What we have is a companion object and the methods of this object are referenced in the same way. So that's by email address parse. You see the code from the Java static method has ended up in that companion object. And to be called from Java, it needs to be marked with this JVM static annotation that IntelliJ has helpfully put in for us. So if we look at where this is called from, in a test, for example, this is still Java and it's able to call email address parse as if it was this static function here. But in fact, it's now a method on our companion object. Okay, our Java class was 52 lines long and our Kotlin one is only 36. So things are quite a bit shorter in Kotlin already, despite this companion object malarkey, but we can make things better. These equals and hash code methods are really quite wordy and the Kotlin compiler will generate them for us if we declare the email address to be a data class. So we can put in data class there 
And if we do that, we can take out this method and this one. And let's run the test to see whether it works. Good. Data classes will also generate a two string for us. But for email addresses, we have a special case. So we'll define our own one. We could have defined our own equals and hash code, and they would have overridden the compiler generated one. Finally, then we can get rid of this import as unused. And this little refactor is done for now. This companion object here is still a bit of a shame, but we need some more context before we can fix that. We'll come back to it in chapter nine when we look at converting static methods to top level functions. Before we go on, data classes have one more trick up their sleeve, and that's that the compiler generates copy methods for them. So say we wanted to add a method to find the postmaster for a given email address. In Java, we'd have to write something like postmaster address, which is an email address, and we would return constructing a new email address with a local part of postmaster and the domain from our current object. With the Kotlin data class though, we don't have to call the constructor. We can take an existing object, this, and call copy on it, telling it the name of the thing we want to change. So in this case, we want to change the local part to be postmaster and return that. But we also could have made a copy changing just the domain. These copy methods make dealing with immutable objects a lot easier because we can take a data object and get a copy with one or more of its fields changed. Compared to Java, at least before records, data classes are a fantastic feature of Kotlin. They allow us to easily create a type to represent, for example, the intermediate results of a calculation. They're not a panacea though. Here we've got money, and this looks like another good candidate for a data class. It has two fields, amount and currency, and a private constructor, because when we build a money object, we want to make sure that its amount field has the right scale for its currency. This comes down to how many minor units of the currency there are in a major unit. So in pounds, we have 100 pence. In dollars, we have 100 cents. But there are no minor units of Japanese yen, for example, and Jordanian dinars have a thousand fields. So we have these money of static methods, these factories, that make sure that money always has two compatible fields. We also have two getters, get amount and get currency, and the equal task code and two string the data class would conveniently implement for us. And finally, we have money add that allows us to add two amounts in dollars, for example, but not add dollars to euros. So let's start by converting this to Kotlin. And again, we'll say, yes, do convert anything else. And now we'll compare the new money.kt with the old money.java. Okay, here we can see the Java public class money and here the Kotlin class money. Our Java class had a private constructor and you can see that's here in Kotlin. But since we wrote the book, the Java to Kotlin converter has changed a little and here not for the better, I think. At this point, we've got these JVM fields. And for some reason, the converter has changed the getters that used to be in the Java code with direct field access. So this was get currency here and now it's just M currency. I don't know why it's done that. So let's revert the change. And this time we'll tell the converter not to fix up other things. So we'll say no here. Okay, that's better. Now we just have our plain fields here and the callers are left with get currency. But if we try to run the tests, then we find the conversion now hasn't made our money of method static. Well, that's a bit of a shame. The converter gets better in some places and worse in others. I think we'll fix things up for IntelliJ. Let's go to these money of methods and we'll add in JVM static. And that means that Java can call them. And everything will compile and pass the tests. Good. If we compare the add methods, we'll see that one nice thing that the converter has done is taken this, if this currency equals that currency, throw a legal argument exception and replace it with the require. Require is a little bit of Kotlin that you see effectively does exactly the same thing, but in a single line, which is nice. Overall, our Kotlin class is quite a bit shorter than Java class, but we still have these equals hash code and two string method. Could we get rid of those by making this a data class? Let's do that. But now hidden in this yellow is a warning, and it's the private primary constructor is exposed via the copy method of a data class. What does that mean? Well, let's go to our tests and find out. On the left then is our money test and I've converted it from Java to Kotlin. 
On the left then is our money test. I've just converted it from Java to Kotlin because copy methods are easier to call from Kotlin. So if we had a test for copy, let's see what we could do. We could say we have some money in pounds is money of hundred pounds in currency UBP. Now, because there are a hundred pence in the pound, we expect that our pounds amount scale to be two for two decimal places. Let's see whether that's true. And similarly for yen, we expect there to be no decimal places. Let's see whether that's true. Good. Now, because of the copy method, we could take our yen and copy changing the currency. So we could say currency equals currencies dot GBP. And this would say bad pounds because pounds should always have a scale of two. But if we try that on our bad pounds, run the tests, you'll see that we've created an invalid object, we created an object with a pounds currency, but with no decimal places rather than two decimal places. So this is an example where we can't safely use a data class. So we'll take that out. And unfortunately that means we have to maintain these equals and hash code methods. But at least we can't do the unsafe copy over here. If we wanted to do this sort of thing, we would have to say money of yen dot amount in GBP. And if we run that, then it passes, making this good pounds. Well, that's the end of Java to Kotlin classes. We've seen how to use the automatic conversion. We've seen how handy data classes are, and we've seen that they're not always applicable. The Kotlin versions of our Java classes may be a little easier to read, but we're certainly not done with them. We'll return to both the email address and money types in later chapters. In particular, chapter 9, multi to single expression functions, and chapter 12, functions to operators.